I want to begin all the way back in ancient Greece in 340 BC. The sciences are flourishing and Aristotle makes mention of a place called Antipodes that had been conceptualized by the ancients. The logic went like this. A great land in the south was needed to balance the known land of the north. Just over a century later, Eratosthenes pretty much successfully calculated the circumference of the world, but there was an issue. The known world only made up one quarter of this circumference. As we moved into the years after Christ, the Roman scientist Ptolemy mapped this great theoretical southern land, now called Terra Australis. But as Europe went into the Dark Ages, these maps were lost, until Renaissance humanism came in the 1400s, an era which also happened to be the era of European exploration. As Ptolemy's map was rediscovered, the quest for Terra Australis began. So this guy right here, Bartolomeu Diaz, attempted to access it from Africa, but found no great landmass at the bottom. Vasco da Gama then sailed the same route to verify that. With Africa not showing up the goods, perhaps the newly found Americas offered a route to Terra Australis, but once again, as Ferdinand Magellan ventured to the south of Chile, Terra Australis was nowhere to be found. But the logic behind it was sound. Surely for the world not to collapse, a huge southern landmass had to exist somewhere. While Europe awaited its answer, cartographers made all sorts of speculation on how to access this mythical land, with some even arguing that the key was perhaps held with Marco Polo. So back in the 13th century, Marco Polo famously traveled through Asia and chronicled it for Europeans. While in modern day Sumatra, Polo wrote of a landmass that the Indonesians called Java La Grande, which was approximately 1300 miles south of Java Major. This was supposedly the largest island in the world and crucially, a path into Terra Australis. Now, very interestingly, we know the Portuguese were extremely close to Australia as they'd made contact with Timor in 1515. By the 1540s, the French Dieppe maps used Portuguese knowledge of the Spice Islands to create a construction of the supposed Java La Grande. This is what they came up with. I wonder what you notice. Firstly, we've got a crocodile right here, which is typical of the tropics and doesn't give away too much. However, this looks an awful lot like the eastern coastline of Australia. Some have even speculated that this right here is Botany Bay, the same bay that Captain Cook sailed into. For me, someone who grew up in Cronulla on the south side of the bay, I don't buy it. What I do think this looks a lot more like is the coastline of Queensland in Australia's north, just below New Guinea. Again, a place that Portugal had been in since the 1520s. If this isn't Queensland, we have to ask ourselves the question, quite literally, what on earth is this place supposed to be? If Portugal never sailed as far south as the Bass Strait, they'd have every reason to think that Java La Grande was the pathway to Terra Australis. However, by the 1560s, all traces of the idea of Java La Grande had disappeared. In 1755, Lisbon suffered one of the worst earthquakes in history, where 85% of their buildings were destroyed, and so to it, the knowledge of whether or not Portugal actually beat Captain Cook in mapping the east coast of Australia. Let me know in the comments below, which European nation reached Australia first? Portugal or the Netherlands. So by the 1600s, Java La Grande was once again a myth and the pursuit for Terra Australis remained very active. And it's in this century that we first start to see Australia appear on European maps. So in 1605, the Dutchman William Janzoon, an employee for the Dutch East India Company, set off from Java to the south coast of New Guinea in pursuit of wealth opportunities. As he sailed along the south coast of New Guinea, he actually ended up right here on the western coast of Cape York. Janssen actually believed that this was just an extension of New Guinea and mistook the Torres Strait for a bay that was closed off further east. He continued to travel south where he encountered the Wikmungan people and it got ugly. According to Janssen, they were cruel barbarians who slew his men and didn't help with trade. According to indigenous oral tradition, relations started positive but deteriorated when Janssen's men raped indigenous women. When the indigenous men retaliated, the Dutch started shooting them. Whatever happened, imagine how world-changing Janssen's arrival would have been for them. Well, perhaps not. Maybe word had traveled about other white men, the Portuguese. Janssen left Cape York and returned to Java. Coincidentally, four months later, Spaniard Luis Fede Torres sailed through the Torres Strait, proving that Janssen hadn't in fact been in New Guinea, but as he sailed through the Torres Strait, he also completely missed the existence of Australia. Janssen returned to the Netherlands to report his findings, but things remained pretty quiet until about a decade after his first voyage. So this guy, Dirk Hartog, set sail from the Netherlands to the Dutch East Indies. However, while venturing round the Cape of Good Hope, he lost contact with the rest of his fleet. 
In an attempt to catch up, Hartog took the risky Roaring Forties route to take a quicker path to Java, but rather than end up in Java, he ended up all the way down here in Western Australia. But Hartog found nothing interested here and just sailed north. And so in the early 1600s, Australia looked like this on the map. In 1636, the Dutch made an attempt to see if it was an island or not, but bad weather forced them to cancel the expedition. But in 1642, Abel Tasman started to give the Europeans a picture of what Australia really looked like on the map. Setting out from Jakarta, Tasman's crew sailed first to Mauritius and then along the south coast of Australia to this island. He named it Van Diemen's Land after the Governor General of the Dutch East Indies, but later it'd be aptly renamed to be after him, Tasmania. Tasman then left Van Diemen's Land to sail east to New Zealand, arriving on the South Island. This resulted in a tense standoff between the Dutch and the Ngāti Tumatako Kiri, which saw the Dutch fire cannons at the Maoris and the Ngāti attacking the Dutch ships, killing four sailors. Tasman came to call this Murderer's Bay and fled to the North Island before also encountering Fiji and Tonga. So the Dutch came to have a pretty good understanding of the lands they called New Holland, and the Dutch East India Company was extremely profitable. Yet as of 2023, I'm recording this video in English and not Dutch. So what happened? Well, the Netherlands never claimed New Holland as an official colony, and the Dutch East India Company simply didn't view it as a profitable venture. So with the Dutch passing on Australia, there was a huge vacuum to be filled, and a century later, Britain would pounce. So this guy right here is Alexander Dalrymple, and he was one of the biggest proponents of Terra Australis in the 18th century. However, with knowledge of New Holland, much of the world was starting to deride the idea of Terra Australis. In 1768, Dalrymple actually secured approval from the Royal Society, Britain's Academy for the Sciences, to go to the South Pacific to observe the transit of Venus. Really, this was just a ruse to find Terra Australis. However, the Royal Society ruled that Dalrymple was unfit to lead the expedition, and that instead it needed someone with experience in the Navy, and they chose Captain James Cook. With the approval of King George, Cook left Plymouth in 1768 and reached New Zealand in 1769. They became the second Europeans to set foot there, trailing 127 years after Abel Tasman. Having spent six months tracking the coastline of New Zealand, Cook sailed west to Point Hicks before travelling north to disembark at Botany Bay. He set foot in modern day Cornell, funnily enough, right where I did my primary school cross country. The bay was so plentiful with stingrays and plants that Cook's accompanying scientist, Joseph Banks, aptly called it Botany Bay. You might be surprised to know this, but the local Guigal people weren't actually caught entirely off guard by this. You see, as the Endeavour moved further and further north along the eastern coast, those on board noted repeated fire. What this was was actually a signal given amongst the indigenous nations to more or less say, we've got company. Two Guigal men met the Endeavour with spears. Cook's attempt to offer beads as the carrot and then gunfire as the stick fell short. As they landed, they were met with more spears before another gunshot forced a retreat. Cook and his men found children hiding in huts where they left beads and collected about 50 spears. The Guigal kept their distance as Cook left after a week to chart the rest of the eastern coast. As the 1770s progressed, Britain faced a number of issues. Firstly, Cook was actually killed in a botched attempt to kidnap the monarch of Hawaii. Secondly, France was on the back of defeat in the Seven Years' War, and they were very eager to reclaim a semblance of global power by colonising. And finally, Britain had just lost the American Revolution, and therefore lost the ability to continue using America as a penal colony. Instead, it needed to redirect its attention elsewhere, before, of course, France got involved. Cook's psychic banks had since advocated the need to colonise New Holland, and in 1787, the first fleet was sent to Botany Bay to establish a settlement made up of convicts. The fleet was led by this guy, Governor Arthur Phillip. But as Australians might remember from Year 3 history, Botany Bay simply didn't live up to the hype, and after only a couple of days, Phillip ventured further north to Sydney Cove. Like the video if you feel Botany Bay got hard done by here. However, before Philip Upton left, the British had company. Of course, none other than the French. Commodore Laperouse, a Seven Years' War veteran, had rocked up in the bay just days after Philip, and this could have gone one or two ways. War or peace. Philip had absolutely no appetite for war whatsoever, and he let the French stay with them as they established their settlement, though he never actually met Laperouse face to face. Laperouse then sailed and left to the Solomons, where he died. To this day, the north side of Botany Bay bears his namesake. So Philip had redirected the colony from here to here. However, Sydney had long been under the control of the Eora people and Cook's tense encounter was well documented. Philip gave official orders not to harm the indigenous population and pursued coexistence. 
Having remembered what happened in Kurnell 18 years before, the Eora wanted nothing to do with the settlers and made all efforts to avoid them. Philip then resorted to kidnapping. But there was an issue here. When the British would kidnap one of the Eora, for instance a Rabanu, they'd die from smallpox. However, one who survived was a guy called Benelong. Now, Benelong was held captive but learned English very quickly and frequently dined with Philip, entertaining him with stories of war. But a couple of months after his capture, Benelong escaped. Four months later, he was spotted up here in Manly Cove and Philip paid him a personal visit. Now, what went down in that meeting remains somewhat contested. These appear to be the facts. At some point in the encounter, Benelong showed Philip the spear scars on his own body as if to say this is a rite of passage. Philip and his men then laid down their weapons to which one of Benelong's surrounded warriors then speared Philip in the shoulder. Now, if they wanted to kill Philip, they most certainly would have. After this, Philip and his men fled away from the cove, but the governor ordered no retaliation on the warriors. Some historians even call this the first attempt at reconciliation. But here's the thing. Philip completely misunderstood Benelong's authority. He had no idea that the Eora land was completely decentralized and that as a Wangal man, he carried little authority down the river towards other indigenous clans. Though the two maintained good relations, Benelong warned Philip that if he went any further down the Parramatta River, the reception would be much more hostile. But by 1790, Philip was in a really difficult situation. There'd been huge supply issues for food and Sydney Cove wasn't proving to be the best agricultural land. The colonists had even reached out to a guy called Pemelway to hunt food in exchange for goods. And this man would really come to haunt the colonists. So as settlers moved to the fertile fresh water of the West, Pemelway made it clear that they were not welcome, often burning their crops to the ground along with any other sense of settlement. Pemelway was from Bidjigal land, where La Perouse would eventually be named. It's likely that as a boy, he watched Cook's interaction with the Gweagle from the other side of the bay. In 1790, Pemaway also speared Philip's gamekeeper, John McIntyre, this time killing him. It's widely believed that this was in retaliation to McIntyre being violent. Documentation suggests that McIntyre knew bits and pieces of the local language and was confident enough to put his weapon down to talk with the warrior with the scarred left eye, the man who we know to be Pemaway. Given this sort of existing relationship, it's hard to imagine that this attack was unprovoked. It's also documented that Benelong had particular hatred for McIntyre, which is very different to how he treated Philip. In retaliation to Pemaway's assassination of McIntyre, Philip ordered 50 Marines to go on an expedition, demanding two captured and 10 killed. The expedition failed to find a single Bidjigal person and he ordered them to go again. Now, it was well and truly war. Pemaway persuaded surrounding nations to join as a coalition force to conduct guerrilla warfare against the settlers. Crucially, Pemaway only targeted the outskirts of the colony, choosing Parramatta, George's River, Toongabby and the Hawkesbury. Again, his tactics were to burn crops and kill livestock, knowing that without that, the settlers couldn't survive off the land like they could. During a battle in Botany Bay of all places, a British soldier named John Caesar shot Pemaway in the head. He himself was a black colonist, likely from the West Indies or from Madagascar, who had been sent to Australia for theft. But despite being literally shot in the head and having a leg iron on, Pemaway broke free and the British started to believe that he was invincible. Now, of course, these injuries impeded Pemaway's fighting ability, but not his organization, as he'd even gotten support from colonial defectors like Thomas Thrush and William Knight. But by the end of the 1790s, the game was different. Philip actually returned to Britain for kidney stones treatment in 1792, and although he wanted to return, his doctors advised him to medically retire. The lack of clarity around the leadership meant that discipline was a bit looser, and many colonists expanded without government approval. For instance, many went a fair way northwest to claim prime farming real estate right here by the Hawkesbury River. With this came rape and pillaging, and indigenous warriors responded with revenge stealth attacks, even dismembering and torturing some to death. The extremely violent nature of this part of the conflicts would foreshadow the horrors that would later come in Tasmania. As conflict remained all throughout Sydney, Pemaway eventually met his fate as late as 1802. Historically, the generally accepted belief is that a hunter called Henry Hacking killed Pemaway. For lack of a better word, he was Governor Hunter's fixer and eventually got exiled to Tasmania for shooting his mistress. Real stand-up guy. And they actually decided to name our local river after him. This has, however, come into question more recently, with some arguing that it was more likely Pemaway was killed by someone from Parramatta. After Pemaway's death, his son continued the resistance until his death, but by the early 1800s, the Sydney settlement was well and truly established and expanding. As for Benelong, he travelled alongside famous explorer George Bass to venture back to Britain, perhaps even meeting King George himself. But upon returning to Australia, Benelong opted to return to the bush and wrote a letter of gratitude to the Phillips family for housing him in England. 
This is the first known piece of writing from an indigenous person that's in English. Bennelong would occasionally dine with the governor, but more often participated in indigenous retaliatory attacks and was often seen officiating ceremonies. For this, the English derided him for choosing a life of so-called savagery over a life of civility. As George Bass remarkably disappeared in the Pacific Ocean, Matthew Flinders lost his partner in crime, and so to his belief that Terra Australis would one day be found. New Holland was the closest thing that could be found to Terra Australis, and so Matthew Flinders wrote, had I permitted myself any innovation upon the original term, it would have been to convert it into Australia, as being more agreeable to the year, and an assimilation to the names of the other great portions of the earth. And so to it, the great southern landmass came to be known as Australia. Of course, the real Terra Australis would actually be found just six years later when Antarctica was discovered in 1820. It's crazy. For over 2,000 years, the world was waiting to use that name on the southernmost land, but just six years before it was actually found, they gave up on the name. Never have I felt more patriotic than remembering the fact that we mugged off Aristotle, Marco Polo, Alexander Dalrymple, James Cook, Matthew Flinders, and even literally Antarctica. And you can learn about the entire history of Australia as a nation state right here. My personal favourite chapter is the time that the CIA and the Crown got our Prime Minister fired. Click here to learn all about it.